for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. Uh, is, is the sound okay for everybody? Yes, yes. Thanks. Okay, so what I would like to discuss uh, today is a project that um, we are working on with uh, Thierry Bodido, Isabel Gallagher and Sergio Simonella. So it's a very, very uh, a long term project, actually. And, and so before I, I will enter a little bit more in the, into the, the results that we uh, get recently, I would like to explain what is the, say, the global overview of uh, what we have in mind. Okay, so the, the system that we are considering is a very simple system. Actually, it's maybe uh, the simplest one that you can imagine, a dynamical system consisting of small uh, art spheres, which can go either uh, in straight lines with constant velocity, or which can collide if uh, at some point they are exactly at a distance of epsilon. Okay, so this is, say, a very simple model for, uh, for gases. And of course, now what we would like to understand about this, this model is, is how it behaves qualitatively when the number of particles is very, very large. Let me just recall that in a, in a gas, say in the room where you are, the, the number of particles is something like 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 30. I don't know, it's a very, very large number. And of course, it's, it's just impossible to describe the motion of each one of these particles. Okay, so if you would like to understand qualitatively the motion of, of your gas, then you need to understand the statistics of, of this gas. So something which is very well known is, is the statistics uh, of such a gas at equilibrium. Okay, so if, if you just forget about the dynamics and just look at the, the relative position of the, the particles, then uh, there, there is a huge literature about uh, statistical physics. Okay, but now what we would like to understand is the, the, the dynamics of, of this gas. So the dynamics of this uh, very, very large system of art spheres. Okay, so uh, the equation for, for each uh, art sphere are very simple. So you just write that the derivative of the velocity is zero until uh, it collides with another particle. And that uh, the derivative of the position is just equal to VI. Okay. And then uh, the other thing that you have to prescribe is how the system will react when you have a collision between two particles. And this is what is written here. So what you, ex what you say or what you assume is that uh, these collisions are elastic so that uh, both the momentum and the energy are conserved. And then you, you see that uh, you have no choice for uh, if you don't want the particles to overlap, then you have a unique uh, possibility to have uh, the velocity v prime and w prime after the collision in terms of uh, the velocity before the collision and the impact parameter omega. Okay, so this system is uh, very well defined, except if you have very pathological uh, situation where, for instance, uh, three particles collide at the same time, but this will happen only for a, a zero measure set of initial data, so we will completely forget about this uh, pathological situation. Okay, so this, this, this is what you um, would like to understand. And of course, now what I said is that uh, it's just impossible to describe uh, this, this complete system. And so what you would, would like to understand is the statistics of uh, this, uh, this system. Okay, and, and, but we don't want to add some noise in the dynamics itself. So the only thing that you can average is the initial uh, distribution, okay, the initial configuration. So actually you have two different uh, settings where you can uh, uh, do this, this kind of averaging over the initial configuration. So either you fix the number of particles, so, and then you, so for instance, denote by capital N this number of particles. And then what you say is that, of course, you have many uh, different possibilities to arrange your initial particles at time zero. But, uh, but then uh, the equation for, the, for, for the, the density of these particles is a very simple equation, which tells you uh, both uh, the condition of transport. So here you see that essentially you have just one term in this equation, which tells you that each position xi will be uh, transported by the velocity vi. Okay, so this, this is just uh, the transport part of the equation. And now the collision, they are encoded in the, um, in the boundary condition. So here this domain tells you that the, the particles cannot overlap. And then you say that uh, on the boundary, you need to prescribe this, this, uh, this scattering or this uh, boundary condition that uh, the, uh, the, the particles will be re-emitted with uh, this, uh, this new uh, post-collisional velocities. 
Okay, so the equation at this level is very simple, but of course you see that it's a little bit uh, exaggerated because n is uh, very, very big. And so this function here, it lives on a very, very big phase space. Okay, so of course you are not really interested in this, this function here, but just on some finite dimensional projection of this Wn. Okay, so now there is another way you can, uh, or uh, maybe uh, average a little bit more about the initial, uh, initial configuration, which is to assume that you are in a grand canonical setting, so that actually the number of particles is also a random variable, and we essentially assume that this uh, random variable is distributed according to a Poisson process. Okay, so now you see that uh, you can have, you can choose n, uh, any number of particles between say one and plus infinity, and uh, then once you have uh, uh, chosen your n, then you assume that of course you have no exp you have no overlap between the particles, which is uh, the reason why you have this characteristic function here. And then you assume that all particles are essentially um, independent. That's why you have this this uh, this uh, uh, tensor product here, and with the and uh, identically distributed. That's why uh, you see that all particles uh, i are distributed according to this f naught here. And then you have this one over z epsilon, which is just a normalization factor. Okay, so say um, the reason why you choose this initial configuration is that you, you say, okay, the only thing that I can really measure at time zero is the macroscopic uh, distribution of particles that have position x and velocity v at time zero. And then what I say is that say this is, um, the, 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 the distribution, which has, say, not zero uh, correlation, but say less correlation as, 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 um, as little uh, correlation as possible. Okay, so the only correlation that you have at this time zero is the fact that the particles cannot overlap. Okay, so now what I say is that you have a deterministic uh, dynamics, which is given by this uh, Hamiltonian system. And now the only randomness in the system is given by this initial data. Okay, so of course you see that uh, this 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 uh, now you have two parameters in your system. So one parameter is this uh, par this uh, new epsilon, which tells you a uh, uh, the typical number of particles that you have because here you recognize this uh, Poisson process. And the other part the other parameter is epsilon, which is uh, the typical size. Of the particles, okay, and so now what we would be interested in is a specific regime where you expect, say, both transport and collision uh, to um, to be uh, important and actually to be as important uh, in the limits, okay. And this this uh, scaling, this particular scaling, is what is called the Boltzmann grad scaling. And so what you expect is that essentially when when one particle um, it's a per unit of time, of course, if the velocity of, of order one, you expect the particle uh, to uh, have a distance uh, uh, to move from of a distance of the order of one. But in this uh, regime, this uh, specific regime, you will expect also each particle to undergo one collision in one unit of time. Okay, and so you can uh, see that this will happen, say, in average. If you uh, have this this uh, this uh, scaling assumption here, that new epsilon, which is the typical number of particles, times epsilon, which is the diameter of the particles, to the d minus one, this is the dimension of uh, your uh, uh, space, is of the order of one. And the reason why you have this is a competition actually that uh, goes back to to Maxwell, uh, where you say that in order that two particles i and j collide on a time interval t. You need to say if assume that it's uh, really the first collision of these particles, then uh, they move uh, with uh, this this uh, uh, straight uh, motion, and so you you see that you what you need is that at some point you have the position which are exactly at distance epsilon, and now the position is given by x i minus v i times s, and the position of j is given by x j minus v j times s. So you would like to be uh, in this cylinder here. And it tells you that now you can compute the volume of the cylinder. And of course, it's of the order of epsilon to the d minus one times uh, time t. Okay, this is capital T actually. Okay, now if you have uh, mu epsilon particles, then the, say the probability for one particle to have a collision is mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus one. So it will be of the order of one. 
Okay, so in particular, you see that in, in this regime, if you look at the total volume of particles, which is oh, like... Sorry theory, to interrupt. We, we, yeah, do, sure. we do not see the, the right part of, uh, of the slides. Oh. And the, um, the center better the, your slide. Better yeah. like this? Perfect, this. perfect. Something. Okay, I sent a message to Laura, but she didn't see. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Great. Okay, so now you see that in this regime, so you expect one, one collision per unit of time per particle. Okay, but now if you look at the total volume by the particles, this is like mu epsilon, which is the number of particles, times epsilon to the d, okay, the volume of the, each sphere is of the order of epsilon to the d. Now if, if mu epsilon is very large, epsilon will be very small, and you see that mu epsilon times epsilon to the d is of the order of zero, okay? So this, this means that with uh, such a regime, what you expect to describe is a, a very uh, specific class of gases uh, for which you have no excluded volume. Okay, so this, this is what is usually uh, called perfect gases. Okay, so this is, this is the system we are interested in. So deterministic uh, dynamics with the statistics on the initial configurations and this uh, specific uh, scaling. And now the question that we, are, uh, we would like to understand uh, the first one is, is say, uh, probably most natural one, is can you say something about uh, the dynamics that you will observe? Okay, so the dynamics that you will observe, say, is the almost sure dynamics. So is it true that for almost uh, all initial configuration, you will see something which is uh, governed by, a, by an equation that you can uh, describe? Okay, so this this is, say the equivalence, say for a simpler system of the law of large numbers, okay? You would like to understand if you have a concentration on one specific dynamics, okay? So this is the first question. And now if you think about, um, about uh, say, uh, usual statistical systems at, at equilibrium, once you know this, this uh, law of large number, what you would like to understand are the deviation um, uh, with respect to this, uh, this uh, mean, uh, mean evolution or mean, uh, mean uh, state, okay? And so uh, this is a question that, uh, that is um, relevant here as, uh, as well. So uh, if you can describe this almost short dynamics, say what is the typical order of the error if you take, say, if you pick one configuration at random, okay? So this, this is, say, the counterpart of the central limit CRM for a usual statistical system, okay? So this is question two. And then uh, there is another question, which is uh, uh, also very important, which is, um, uh, and which is important, especially when you are uh, looking at uh, rare events. And uh, now it's the question which is uh, uh, very um, important for many uh, applications. So what is the probability of observing something different? Okay, so you have this mean dynamics, and now you can prescribe any other dynamics and you would like to compute the probability of seeing this very strange uh, dynamics. Okay, so these are the, the, the three very natural questions that usually people are able to answer for, um, say, for a classical system. And now we would like to be able to understand the same questions uh, for this uh, specific system, where once again, uh, remember that, say, randomness comes only from the initial data. Okay, so that's really, uh, the difficult point here, the, the main issue here, is that you don't have randomness which uh, comes, say, dyna dynamically uh, just from some noise, but everything is encoded in the initial data. So once you have, somehow, once you know the uh, initial data, you know the, the configuration for all times. Okay, of course, you cannot say much more about it, but say, in principle, uh, there is a unique evolu possible evolution. Okay, so. Um, um, so question one, actually, um, uh, the first answer to, to this question, and actually it's almost uh, uh, the best answer uh, up to date, um, is uh, this theorem by, uh, by Lanford. I think the, the date of the theorem is something like 1973, okay, which tells you that, so if you look at this specific scaling that I, I discussed before, which is called the boxman grad scaling, so when the, the number of the typical number of particles goes to infinity and the size of the particles goes to zero with this relation that mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus one is equal to one. 
Then if you look at the empirical measure, so uh, what it means is that if you take any uh, smooth function h, which we will call an observable, and now you test this function by just looking at the expectation of, of uh, one over mu epsilon, which is this typical number of particles, and then you sum over all particles in your system, h tested at, uh, say, the configuration z i of t. Okay, so this is just, uh, uh, you see that you will average over, uh, first of all, over uh, the particles, okay? So here, uh, one very important thing is that all the particles are exchangeable, so you can just say that you are not interested in one, part, in one specific particles, but just average over all possible particles. And then here, you see that you average over all possible initial configurations. Okay, so you look at this, this average, and now you, uh, you see that, of course, it depends on time, because uh, you now look at the, the configuration at time t. And you can prove that it will concentrate on the solution to this uh, Boltzmann equation. So the Boltzmann equation was written uh, uh, essentially one century before by, uh, by Boltzmann, say on a heuristic basis. Okay, and now you see that this, this, uh, the structure of this, this equation is a little bit different. So you have here the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is very similar to the Liouville equation that I wrote at the very beginning. It just tells you that, say, just forget about the right-hand side. If here you have zero, then you see that this transport just tells you that particles are just transported uh, with velocity. Okay, so this part here is just transport. And now the right-hand side here tells you that uh, there is another effect which is important in this uh, gas which is the effect of collision. And so let me uh, comment a little bit uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, definition of this uh, collision operator. So uh, the first thing is you see that uh, this is an operator which is quadratic, which comes from the fact that essentially the only uh, collision which are really relevant are collision with two particles. Okay, we, we said at the very beginning that uh, having three particles colliding at the same time is an event of probability zero. Okay, so, so this is a quadratic operator just because this collision I, I, are, um, are um, quadratic. And now uh, there is another uh, very important feature of this, this collision operator is that somehow here t and x are just parameters. Okay, so meaning that the collision in the limit, you see that the, the size of the particles is essentially zero. And so uh, when the two particles collide, they are exactly at the same position. Okay, so t, the time, and x, the position of two colliding particles are equal. Okay, so q now is not an operator acting on this variable t and x. t and x are just uh, parameters. Okay, so now what uh, this, this, this collision operator does is that it tells you that, uh, say, uh, if you look at the number of particles with uh, velocity v, then it can, it can decrease just because the particle of velocity v will collide with another uh, particle of velocity v star. Okay, so you see that here you have a minus sign. This is what is called the, the, the loss term. And you will have less particles of velocity v if you have particles of velocity v which collide with particles of velocity v star and then are scattered and have different velocities. Okay, so this is really a jump process in the velocity space. And now you, you, uh, you can also create new particles. So create is not, uh, it's not uh, really uh, create a new particles, but just so this is the other part of the jump process that you have, can have a new particles of velocity v just by collision of two particles of velocity v prime and v prime star. So this is what is called the gain term, okay? And now you have this, uh, this, this uh, integration uh, um, measure here, which tells you uh, the probability of such a jump process. Okay, so now this, you see that uh, what is important here, and I, I, I didn't uh, uh, write it again, but V prime and V prime star are given by the same scattering law as at the, as the very beginning. So omega is the impact parameter, and uh, V prime and V prime star are defined in terms of V, V star, and omega. Okay, so this, this, uh, this collision operator describes this jump process, which tells you that sometimes, and now you see in the limit, it's the, the time where this, this, can, this kind of event will happen is now random. So uh, you have a jump process, which is 
which has say two types of randomness. One is the time where, where uh, it occurs. And the other one is, you see that this is, this is um, another uh, integration parameter here, which is this impact parameter. Okay, so now these parameters, uh, time and omega becomes random, and you have this jump process. Okay, and so uh, the results of uh, Lanford is that uh, this, this uh, Boltzmann equation is the law of last number associated to uh, my system of particles, at least on a very short time uh, t, uh, zero t, which depends only on f naught. Okay, and of course you need to prescribe the initial data for this uh, kinetic equation, which is f naught. Okay, so this essentially answers the first question, but actually there are there are uh, two um, say issues with this statement. So the first one is uh, is an issue which is very well known actually, uh, uh, which was um, written by uh, Zermelo and Loschmidt uh, say at the time where Boltzmann uh, wrote this equation for the first time. You see that uh, this uh, this so I will not give the the proof, but uh, one fact is that this, uh, this Boltzmann equation, which is written here, you can uh, see that uh, actually it admits a Lyapunov functional. Okay, so meaning that uh, you have an entropy for the system, which is very important because actually it tells you that you can uh, uh, somehow um, write uh, a mathematical formulation of this uh, second principle of thermodynamics. Okay, but now uh, because you have this uh, second principle, actually this evolution is not reversible. Okay. And so this means that you start from a system which is Hamiltonian, where everything is reversible. You can just uh, uh, say, at least uh, it's uh, uh, in your mind, you can imagine that, uh, that you, at some point you reverse all velocities, and then you will go back e exactly to the initial uh, state. And this is not possible for uh, this Boltzmann equation. So this means that at least you have uh, lost something in the limiting process. Okay. And so then the, there is this question, and this is one question I would try to answer a little bit uh, in the CEQA, that is it possible to retrieve some reversibility? So to keep enough information to, to have something in the limits, describe a kind of process or a kind of object, mathematical object, which is reversible. Okay, here, the fact that in the limit you get something which is irreversible uh, tells you that uh, you lose a lot of information. Okay, so this, this is a first, say, uh, issue, which is a kind of philosophical issue. You start from something which is uh, reversible and then end, end up with uh, something which is not. And so this means that uh, essentially you have lost a lot of information and you would like to understand where this information is anchored. Okay, and then uh, there is this second question, and I think I will not have time to discuss it, but uh, we have uh, currently we have uh, a new. Um, work in progress about it, which is the fact that uh, if you look at this, uh, this, uh, this CRM, it's true only on a, on a small time interval. And actually, you can even estimate this time in T here and see that actually, if you take a typical particle, then uh, the probability that this particle uh, has a collision during this small short time interval is something which is less than one. Okay, so of course, this means that in the wool system, you have still a lot of collision, that is enough to see the irreversibility, but still it's very uh, short because you have a collision model where you see almost no collision. Okay, so th this is really uh, uh, an issue if you would like to use this, this, um, this Boltzmann equation to, I, I don't know, to, try to, to look at the relaxation process and so on, you see that you would like to, to be able to say that it's uh, a good description of the dynamics on a very long time. Okay, so then there is the question of uh, say, uh, is this limitation a purely technical or is it this limitation, um, I don't know, is uh, related to some uh, phase transition or to something like this? Okay, so, so the problem is why is it, so the problem that, uh, that uh, of course, you see that if you have lost a lot of information, it's, it's not a, a, a big surprise that it's not possible to iterate the proof. But now, uh, now if you are able to retrieve a little bit of, uh, of uh, reversibility here, maybe uh, it's opened the door for, um, for an iteration or at least to, to understand uh, a little bit uh, better what happens for longer times. Okay, so um, 
Of course, I will not discuss all the details of uh, this proof because uh, this is not, say, the main um, the main purpose of this lecture. But but I think it's important to tell you, say, to introduce the um, the general approach that we have for this proof because it will be exactly the same to to go uh, beyond this uh, law of large numbers. Okay, so. Um, um, the say the usual proof. Of course, you see that the problem here is that you have a function. So if you think about the the canonical setting, but it's the same for the grand canonical setting, you see that the number of particles is uh, bigger and bigger. The typical number of particles is uh, bigger and bigger. And so of course uh, it doesn't it's, it's don't make sense to look at the limit of w n. Okay, just because n goes to infinity, so your function, your distribution lives in a phase space which is bigger and bigger. And so then it's it's not an object where you can expect to describe a limit for, for this, okay? So the only thing that you can expect to have a limit is any finite dimensional projection of, of this, this uh, distribution, okay? And so this is exactly what is uh, uh, introduced here in, uh, in blue. So these are called the uh, correlation functions. So Fn epsilon, so Fn is a function of small n variable and now n is fixed so n can be one it can be two it can be any uh, fixed number and now you see that um, what you are interested in is to test this this uh, this uh, correlation function against uh, a test function here which depends on n arguments okay and so this will be the expectation of of this this uh, this quantity here so you take hn you take uh, any um, any uh, family of uh, so any n uplets of of uh, particles, and now you look at uh, this this kind of uh, measure. So you take H n on all these n uplets, and then you have this to uh, renormalize. Because of course, this sum is like n sum over uh, mu epsilon particles. Okay, so this is just a normalization, and here this is just uh, so H n is just your test function. So here you see that you define a finite dimensional projection of the probability measure. Okay, so this 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 now is a good object in the sense that you can expect to have a limit for this. Okay, so now of course, if you would like to describe the dynamics of this guy here, uh, the first thing that you try to do, okay, it's very natural. You try to write an equation for this this uh, this um, uh, correlation function. And so you can just uh, start from the Liouville equation, integrate over all remaining variables, and then you see that uh, the transport is uh, very nice. Okay, so now you get that uh, your n particles will be transported with this uh, this transport operator here. But of course, then uh, just because of the exclusion, you have some boundary terms. Okay, it's just um, uh, the Stokes formula or Green formula, and so you have boundary terms. Okay. So these boundary terms, they occur when one of the particles between uh, one and n touch another particle, which was not already uh, tagged. Okay, so you have n tagged particles here, and you see that, of course, you have a boundary when one of these particles is at the distance of the other, of, so at the distance epsilon from another particle. Okay, and so you see that at this point, of course, depend on, another one particle and so this means that you don't have a closed equation for fn it depends on fn plus one okay so this tells you that essentially you have a collision between particles i and n plus one and so now you have to add this particle n plus one and so you say that uh, it's a little bit annoying because uh, now instead of uh, just integrating this equation you see that you will have a source term and this source term will um, um, will have fn plus one, and so you need to write the equation for fn plus one, and then this equation for fn plus one will um, will uh, involve fn plus two and so on. Okay, so if you iterate the dual n formula, you get that, say, if you would like to understand what is fn at time t, you have a, a lot of possible combination, okay, so you can write the solution as, say, an operator, a sum of operator acting on all of uh, correlation function of either order, okay? And so this, now this operator here, what it tells you is that you transport, so you start with n particles, you transport your n particle, then another particle, then transport uh, the n plus one particle, and so on, 
Okay, so this is just like a, a big, big sandwich where you have transport, collision, transport, collision, transport, collision. Okay, so now this is an, an explicit formula for the solution. Of course, it's not, say, written like this, it's not very useful, but say, if everything is well defined, if all the series are convergent, then uh, this object is, is, is the solution of uh, this uh, hierarchy of equations. Okay? So now it's, uh, say, the analytic uh, representation is a very, uh, um, it's a little bit uh, like um, tough, and we don't want to write uh, all these uh, big formulas. And so now let me explain uh, how you can um, think about this, this, uh, all these formulas in more geometrical terms. Okay. So what I say is that if I look at this, this, uh, this operator here, this um, solution operator here, what I say that, so I will have, uh, sorry, first my n particles. I start with n particles, then I go backwards. And at some point, I need to, to, to add a new particle. Okay. And so now I, I have many ways to add this new particle because I can add this new particle close to each one of these uh, uh, n particles. Okay, so I have a first branching where I have to, to prescribe if the particle n plus one is added to uh, one, two, or n. Okay, so I have first branching, I have uh, n, n, uh, n vertices, and now I have a new edge between n plus one and one of this. Uh, this uh, n vertices. Then I, I have transport, so I don't care about transport for the moment. And then I have another collision. And at this time now, I have to add a new particles close to one of the n plus one particles which are already present in the system. Okay, so now if I would like to understand the combinatorics of collisions, then I can I can uh, encode this this uh, uh, I can encode this this uh, dynamics into a, a, a tree or into n trees. Okay, so you have n roots, which are the particles which are uh, present uh, time t, and I have uh, n new particles, so n branching. Okay, so typically if I start with just one particle, if I am interested in the first correlation function, I start at time t with this particle, uh, say one star, and I go back and then I create a new particle, which I call one, and then I, call, uh, I, I, I create this new particle two, and then the new particle three. And of course, what I have to uh, prescribe is whether the particle two is created uh, close to one star or, or close to one. And then if the particle three is created uh, uh, close to one star or one or two, okay? And now I can uh, represent this dual formula by uh, kind of uh, trajectories, which are re not real trajectories because you see that the number of particles is something which is uh, changing uh, with time. Okay, but so I start with this particle here. I said I, I, I uh, just uh, look at the backward transport of this particle. Then I have this collision, and then I, I will have the, the backward transport of these two particles, and so on. So on each time interval ti, ti minus one, I have backward transport. And then at time ti, I, I just add the particle number i at position uh, xi, which is x ai. So ai a is the, the, the tree here. And plus epsilon omega i, omega i is the impact parameter, okay? And then I have uh, velocity v, v i, but then if I, I, I would like to go back, I need to be sure that v i and v a i of t i are, uh, are uh, pre-collisional, so else I have scattering. Okay, so this, this uh, object here, uh, they are introduced just to rewrite that, um, say, the n particle correlation function at time t, can be written as a sum over all possible n, over all possible trees with n roots and n branching, and then an integral over all possible uh, times of addition, all possible velocities for the added particles, and all possible impact parameters of uh, this f n plus m, and then I just uh, follow the, the uh, this trajectory up to time zero, okay? And here, this this guy here, is, uh, is uh, the collision cross-section, which takes into account the fact that when you integrate here, you have a factor like vi minus vn plus one dot omega. Okay, but I, I will not uh, care too much about this. Okay, so I have this representation. And so now you see that it's important for you to have this in mind that uh, you can represent um, all, say, all possible histories of your system uh, by this, this, uh, this uh, trees, these collision trees, and these trajectories. 
okay? And so then uh, you are almost done for the for landfall proof. Of course, I, I will uh, cheat a little bit and uh, forget about many uh, technical details, but uh, essentially there are two important arguments. The first one is to know whether this formula makes sense, okay, if this series is convergent or not. And that's uh, why you obtain this, um, this uh, short time um, convergence. So what I say, so I will forget about this C because it's complicated and I don't want to spend too much time with these uh, details. But essentially you see that here you have the combinatory, so the number of uh, trees with n roots and n branching. And you see that, say, the number of such trees, this is n for the first choice and n plus one and n plus m minus one. Okay, so you have this, exactly this number of trees. Okay, but now you see that uh, when you integrate respect to time here, you, are, you need that t1 is bigger than t2, which is bigger than t3, etc. So you have a, an ordering of times. So when you integrate over this, this uh, simplex in time, what you get is one over factorial uh, n. Okay, so now if you, uh, if you look at uh, the typical size of uh, each one of these terms, what you obtain is a tm divided by factorial m which is uh, which comes from the, integra the integral with respect to time. Here I put this uh, C naught to the M and C naught depends on the many things. So it depends on the initial configuration, on, uh, on the velocity, and so I will not discuss this. And now here you have the combinatorics of the trees. Okay, but you see that uh, this guy is, uh, is, a, is uh, uh, less than two to the uh, n, plus n, n plus M, something like this. And so here you see that you have a, a, a geometric series, and so it will be convergent for short times. Okay, so this tells you that that this representation of the solution makes sense at least for short time. Okay, so it's of course uh, then you have many uh, uh, technicalities to to especially with large velocities, but but I will not uh, spend time on this. Okay, so this this uh, estimate really is the important estimate to understand why we uh, get the uh, absolute convergence of the series for short times, okay? And then, of course, once you have this convergence, then the, what, if you would like to understand the limit as uh, mu epsilon or epsilon, so mu epsilon tends to infinity or epsilon tends to zero, then you need to understand the, the, the limiting behavior of each one of these terms, okay? And so this is the uh, the second argument in last for proof. So essentially, you have say three arguments. The first one is this uh, representation with a uh, with, uh, series expansion. The second one is, is uh, uh, the estimate which tells you that the uh, series expansion will be convergent. And then the last one is, uh, um, say, the asymptotic behavior of each one of these terms. So what you expect is that if uh, epsilon goes to zero, uh, each one of these uh, pseudo trajectories will converge to a limiting pseudo trajectory. And I will uh, try to explain what is different between this guy here and this guy here. So essentially, if you uh, go back to the definition of the trajectory, you, you, say, you see that you have uh, transports in between two, two collision times. And then at each collision time, you need to add a new uh, particle. Okay. So uh, the main difference, actually, is that, um, say, in the limit, as the size of the particles will be zero, then once the particles are in the system, they can uh, never see each other, okay? So you don't have any, what, what we call recollision, meaning that for instance, this particle three will collide with particle two, okay? So in the limit, this is completely impossible because you, you don't have, so the particles are of size zero, and so they cannot see each other, okay? So this is really uh, the important difference between the, the system uh, for fixed epsilon and the system in the limit, is that uh, you cannot see, uh, uh, you cannot recollide. Okay, and then uh, there is another uh, small difference is that when you add a new particle in the limit, the size is zero, and so you add the particles exactly at the same position. Okay, and so the only thing that you would like to uh, avoid is this uh, recollision uh, event. Okay, and what you can prove is that uh, this kind of recollision. Uh, will just happen for a very, very small set of parameters, which will be negligible in the limit. And so, uh, and so you, if you just uh, remove this free collision, what you obtain is exactly the, the, the expansion, the series expansion of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so now uh, once you have uh, removed these uh, bad trajectories, then you can compare very easily uh, the Boltzmann series expansion and the, the, the series expansion at fixed epsilon. Okay, so these are. Uh, essentially uh, the, the main arguments. 
okay? So now uh, I, I, I'm coming to uh, the new uh, staff here. And uh, maybe uh, the, the first thing that I would like to, to explain is uh, what uh, is our problem with this, this uh, result of Landford. So I, I tell you the first problem is, uh, is the problem uh, with the time, but here I will not discuss this problem. And the other one is the, 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 the problem that I, so the Boltzmann equation is not reversible. And so this means somehow that I have lost a lot of information. And you see very well that in this proof, the way you lose information is that you say that, okay, there is a very small set where maybe the pseudo trajectories will uh, behave in this bad way because you have free collision, but I would just neglect this. Okay, so what you expect is that you have these small sets, okay, so, so these small sets of initial configuration on which something bad will happen, but you say that it will contribute very little to the average. Okay, so say if you are just interested in the law of large numbers, you can just say that, okay, you can just remove these uh, recollisions. Okay, but say once you uh, are removing all these recollisions and uh, and uh, even though it's uh, very localized, it's very, uh, it's it's just for very specific initial configuration. Say you lose a lot of information. It's it's a locate, it's located on very small sets, but still it's a lot of information because it's all the information that uh, allow you to go back. Okay, so 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 now what uh, we would like to understand is a little bit. Uh, the structure of uh, recollisions uh, re and say where the information, where the, the missing information is encoded. Okay. And so the idea actually, it's not exactly um, the, the way we, we just uh, went exactly, but okay. Say that another way, if, in, uh, a way to, to, to understand this, the, this additional correlations is to look at, instead of looking at, at uh, polynomial moments, okay, so if you go back to uh, the definition of this uh, correlation function, which are, um, which are here, you see that essentially what you are doing is to look at, so you can imagine that hn is just a product of uh, n function here, and so essentially what you are doing is to look at polynomial moments of, uh, of your distribution, okay? So now uh, there is a, a way of encoding much more information, which, which is to look at exponential moments of, uh, so now what I will uh, look at is this function, which is called a cumulant generating function. So I take the expectation, not of, uh, not of just one function, but you see that now I take the expectation of the exponential of this um, empirical measure. So this, this is the empirical measure multiplied by mu epsilon. Okay, I take the exponential of this. So this is exponential of mu epsilon times, times uh, the, uh, uh, the empirical measure. Then I take the expectation and then I take the log and one over mu epsilon. Okay, so this is a very uh, classical quantity uh, study in, in uh, statistical physics. But say somehow the, the, the miracle here is that uh, even in the dynamical case, we can do something with this guy. Okay, so. Um, the way you can uh, look at this uh, function is to uh, expand this function uh, as another analytic function of exponential of h, okay? And this uh, this uh, define uh, cumulants, okay? So you can prove that this guy is equal to the sum from one to infinity of one of the factorial n, and then the integral of of this function f n, which I would call cumulant of order n times this function here, which is a factorized function, okay? And then you can define this cumulants, so you can just expand everything, so expand the exponential uh, with the series expansion and the, the, the analytic expansion of the exponential here, then uh, develop everything, okay? Then we use the, the series expansion of the logarithm here, and then you can identify this guy, uh, this cumulant here, with this formula here, so you see that here, the, these are the correlation function that we had previously, and then here, what you say is that you, you decompose any uh, part of uh, n particles uh, in subparts, in S subparts, and then you uh, look at this uh, combinatorics, it's a bit complicated combinatorics, and then here you have the product of uh, the different uh, correlation function. Okay, so this, this is just a formula, okay? You, essentially, uh, we don't care about this formula, except at one point just to identify two objects, okay? 
So what is important is that we are looking at the exponential moments, okay, and that uh, we have a, a series expansion of this exponential moment like this, this cumulus. Okay, and so now what I would like to do is say in the same way, so I had, in, previously I had a, a very uh, nice uh, geometric representation of the correlation function, and now what I would like to have is a geometric representation of this guy. Okay, so um, now it will be uh, probably a little bit um, more, um, just um, try to understand the, uh, the ideas, but uh, I think it's very uh, geometrical, actually it's not uh, so, so bad, okay? so. Now, if I start from the representation of, of uh, this uh, end correlation function with uh, the, the trajectories, I have uh, things like this. So I, I start from uh, n vertices. So here, n is equal to five. And then uh, I know how to construct the pseudodynamics. So I say that uh, I will go back uh, by transport, then add a particle here, then go back by transport, then add a particle here, then add a particle here. And then each time, say, on, on each slice of time, what I have is just transport, okay? But then maybe at some point, I will have some recollision between uh, all the particles in this tree and all the particles in this tree, okay? If I have no recollision, you see that essentially each tree will live independently from, from all the others, okay? So the only way I have really a correlation, a dynamical correlation between two trees like this is if I have a recollision between one particle coming from this tree and one particle coming from this tree, okay? And this is what I call here a recollision. And the same here, so here, I, I have grouped this, this, uh, this uh, five collision trees in two forests, okay? So a forest consists of all the trees which are connected by a recollision, okay? So this, this is much more precise somehow that, than before, because now I will ju not just uh, throw out the, uh, the recollision, but I will really uh, look carefully at, um, at the combinatorics of, of all these objects. Okay, so now if I look at two forests, you see that by definition, two forests, they are not really independent of each other, but say the pseudo trajectories here will have no interaction with the pseudo trajectories in this other forest. Okay? But somehow the fact that they have no interaction is a, is, is a kind of correlation, okay? So now what I will do is to, to say that being far from each other, so remain, have a separation between uh, this forest and this forest, is the same as writing that uh, they are completely independent, minus the fact that they will uh, cross each other. Okay, so this is uh, usual uh, cluster expansion of any, uh, say, uh, any uh, relation that uh, I is close to J. Okay, I can say that uh, I, w the indicator function of uh, one far from I from far from J is the same as one minus the indicator function of I close to J. Okay, so this is what we are doing here now. So I, I say that uh, by, by definition, two forests, two different forests are far from each other, but this I can rewrite with this uh, cumulant expansion. So these are kind of different cumulants, but, uh, uh, I can rewrite this just by uh, by saying that this this indicator function is one minus the fact that lambda i is close to lambda j. Okay, so now I have this and uh, actually this phi n. So this is this is a, a very um, classical computation. Uh, you see that at this level it's the same as uh, uh, statistical physics at equilibrium. Here I don't care about the dynamics. I just look at trees. Uh, living on this uh, slice of time zero t, now I look whether they, they will uh, be uh, close to each other or not, okay? And the same for the forest. So I, I write this, and so uh, say a nice way to expand this, this cumulant here is to say that uh, the cumulant of order n here is the sum over all uh, connected graph of order n of the products of on all edges of this graph of minus one, uh, minus the indicator function of lambda i close to lambda g. Okay, so this is just a very uh, simple expansion of this guy. Okay, so no, no, nothing uh, really uh, uh, new at this point. But what I say is that now I can uh, group this forest into jungle. So now a jungle, so I, I will just, um, I will just uh, expand everything. So I have all this forest and now I, I expand the exclusion of uh, this forest with this overlap here and a jungle 
will be a set of forests which will overlap each other. Okay, so this is another. So what I say is that being far from each other is not being independent, but it's it's the same as being independent minus being uh, minus having an overlap. Okay, so now I have another way to group uh, the forest into channels. Okay, and then I have still another possible uh, source of correlation uh, between all this uh, this uh, big structure, which is which come from initial data. So I, I will not. Uh, detail too much this this one because essentially my initial data as I have chosen it is almost like factorized so I have almost no correlation coming from the initial data so I will not uh, discuss this so here is kind of summary of um, of uh, what I said so I have all these trees okay these dynamical trees I group them into forests just because they have a recollision and I group uh, many forests into a jungle so in a, a black here which tells you that these different forests will overlap each other so at some point they, they will uh, you, you will have two particles at the same place okay and then uh, i can uh, group one uh, one more time using the initial data okay and then i can uh, follow exactly the same uh, same uh, reasoning as previously okay and say that uh, for this uh, cumulus so now uh, just using this formula here which is a little bit technical and um, say all possible a classification of uh, of my pseudo trajectories, I can recognize that actually the 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 the, the, the cumulant of order n corresponds exactly to uh, this this uh, config this, uh, say uh, the case where uh, say all all the graph is connected either by this recollision or by the overlap or by the initial data. Okay, so the the the, the cumulant of order n. You, you really have a, a notion of, of, uh, of cluster which correspond to this uh, of dynamical cluster which correspond exactly to the cumulant. Okay, so once you have this, this means that if you are the, the cumulant of order n, this means that you have a connected graph of size n, and so you will you will so somehow this uh, mu epsilon to the n minus one, which was in the definition of the cumulant, will be exactly composited by the fact that because of this uh, clustering constraints, the size Say the, 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 the you have constraints on the, uh, the, the the configuration at time t on the zn at time t in order that all these uh, recollision and overlaps are possible. You see that typically having one recollision here it tells you that you have a constraint on one star and two star in order that it is possible. Okay, so this the set of of one star and two stars such that this recollision is possible. Its size is typically of the order of one over a mu epsilon. Okay. And so you see that this short time estimate will be a very reminiscent of what we obtained in Landford proof. So using this, all these constraints, of course, then, then uh, the, 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 the thing is that you have many ways to, uh, to, to construct this cluster. So because of this many ways of constructing the cluster, you get this factor n here. And this just comes from ct to the, divided by mu to the n minus 1, which is the size of the constraints, times mu epsilon to the n minus 1, so the mu just disappears. Okay, so this tells you that you have a very uniform estimate for the cumulant. And then, and then you have the, the, the exact counterpart of the second step of Landford's proof, which tells you that you can actually take limits in this uh, rescale cumulant. You see that they are all of order one. So the, 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 the size of this cumulant doesn't depend on epsilon. And actually, you can uh, take limits. And you will get exactly, you can really um, do exactly the same thing and see that uh, say if you have convergence of uh, the this pseudo trajectories with this very strong constraint that you should have exactly n minus one recollision or overlap okay so this is very um you see that it's uh it's a uh, it's a very uh, strong constraint of course this 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 is why you have this uh, very very small uh, set but uh, but then uh, what you can prove is that uh, essentially this this uh, this uh, pseudo trajectories will converge to a limiting object where you have, uh, so as usual, the addition of new particles, the backward free transport, but you have also this n minus one overlap or recollision. And each time you have another one, which is non-clustering. So if, for instance, if you start with two particles here, you see that you can have only, if your graph is uh, minimally connected, you would have just one link here. And what you can prove is that having any other recollision or overlap costs, uh, a lot and so essentially will disappear in the limit so in the limit what you what you get is that 
your limiting class, your limiting cumulant is represented only by minimally connected uh, graphs. Okay, so we have a very precise geometric uh, description of, of uh, the, the cumulant, and so you have a very, uh, li a very precise description of uh, this uh, limiting generating uh, 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 series. Okay, and so I see I'm uh, almost, um, uh, so I had another part, but I, I will uh, just uh, go very uh, fast on it. So just to mention the two results that you can uh, deduce from this. So you see that now at, at this point, uh, you have a very uh, precise uh, uh, information about all these three collisions. So having exactly n recollision, you know exactly how, uh, how much it costs and so on. So now it's not, so you have a recollision and uh, you just, uh, you just uh, forget about uh, the configuration, but you just count things very precisely, okay? And so this uh, gives you both an answer to uh, uh, the fluctuating, uh, uh, so the problem of uh, characterizing the, the fluctuation and also uh, uh, an answer to the problem of large deviation. So let me just uh, maybe uh, state the CRM. So in the Boltzmann grand limit, um, if you look at the fluctuation field, so you look at the empirical measure and just remove this um, this uh, average, which is given by, uh, uh, which is just this uh, first correlation function, you rescale by square root of mu, which is the, the usual size of uh, to, to get a central limit CRM. Then you, you get, uh, a characterization of the, the limiting dynamics, and you get that you have a, what we what is called usually a, a, the fluctuating Boltzmann equation. So you see that here you have the linearized Boltzmann operator with the transport here and the linear part, so the linearized collision operator. Here F is the solution to the Boltzmann equation and H is your fluctuation. So here you have this part here plus noise. Okay, and this noise is delta correlated in T and X. And then you can compute this covariance just going back to the uh, to uh, the cumulant of all the two, okay? And so the, the proof just relies on the study of the characteristic function that you can write with the cumulants, and then you can compute everything, okay? And now the last result is that uh, actually you can uh, also sum uh, this, this uh, you can look at this uh, uh, limiting generating series, and this tells you actually that uh, you can characterize all the uh, large deviation of the uh, empirical measure. Okay, so the fact that uh, the empirical measure is on the compact set on, of this uh, square root space, so the space of trajectories here, um, and or in, a, in a, an open set here, you have the, the usual uh, estimates of, uh, say, large deviation here, with a function on here, which is uh, which coincide with the one that was obtained for a, a stochastic dynamics, so for instance by uh, Freddy Boucher or uh, or Zakan. Okay, so I will not detail all this uh, the, the 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 form of the Hamiltonian and so on. But uh, maybe the only thing that I would like to say is that um, is that uh, say this this functional this large deviation functional actually it satisfies the Hamilton Jacobi equation which is written uh, here, and this equation now is reversible in time. So this means that somehow, uh, looking at all this this, uh, this this correlation on the finer and finer scale, you retrieve enough information to be able to go back in time. Okay, so I think it's it's really uh, the, the 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 major uh, result here is that uh, we are able to look at uh, this very fine uh, correlation and then to retrieve enough information uh, to 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 get this uh, reversibility. Okay, and so I think reversibility is a very good, um, uh, very good news. Also, because maybe it opens the door to to look at a longer time. Okay, so I think I, I should stop here. I'm sorry because uh, the the last part was uh, really really too uh, too fast. But um, but okay, I think it's uh, important to explain how we construct this uh, this uh, this uh, correlation function. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. So we have time for questions and comments. Uh, may, may I ask a, a question? Uh, uh, what, what about uh, large times? Uh, what is the conjecture? Uh, does the Boltzmann equation hold for large times or should it be replaced by something else? So, uh, in general, I don't know. 
uh, what I can tell you is that uh, uh, what I think we're able to do now is the fluctuating Boltzmann equation around equilibrium. So the problem is that, um, so what we would uh, like to be able to prove is that as long as you have a nice solution to the Boltzmann equation, then it's the, the right object. But uh, unfortunately, we are not able to prove something like this. So the problem is, is that you, you should be able to, um, so actually what you have is a kind of uh, a viscous Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the, uh, for fixed epsilon. And then you, you, you need to prove that uh, uh, this, uh, viscous, this viscous term is not so important. But actually what, what, what you need to prove this and what you use in short time is that, uh, say, the series expansion with all the, the graphs. So in the end, we, we keep only, so the Boltzmann uh, staff uh, is the, the, what you obtain when you keep only a minimally connected graph. Okay, and when you expand for fixed epsilon, you have all possible graphs. And the problem is that, of course, all these, this say, all the, all the corresponding trajectories are, are very, um, you have very few of them. But the problem is that the combinatorics is not uh, good at all. So essentially, it's not so clear. So for me, it's not clear that you cannot have a, a phase transition. Oh. So, so, I mean, uh, one thing is, is the rigorous, uh, uh, proof, but what, what about uh, heuristic arguments? So do physicists have a, uh, I mean, have a picture what happens uh, for large times? So, um, I mean, uh, non-rigorously. Yes, even non rigorously it's not so. F so the problem can uh, could be that um, essentially, uh, so you see that you have this, uh, this, this, this. Um, Maybe for me, the easiest way to see that is to, to write the equation, so the equivalent of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation at the level, so for fixed epsilon. So th this we are able to do. And then you see that you have a, a viscous term, so a term where, where you have, instead of uh, the, the derivative of order one that we have here, we have derivative of order two, okay? And so uh, the problem is that we are not, so this, this kind of uh, description and the cumulant on all this, uh, this limit uh, process, this is fine as long as i is analytic, okay? And now if you have uh, this uh, second order term, you see that say, a priori, there is no reason why uh, this, 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 uh, this can exist for long times. So it's, for me, it's not even clear that it's the, the good description. It's not only a, a matter of uh, proving things, but even the, the fact that it's true. So you can imagine that you have, uh, um, say, uh, a lot of entropy, in the in the very large cumulants, I think that there is no um, uh, no objection that uh, say so. My view on this problem is that somehow you have a, so the entropy is conserved, but somehow it flows from a, a small uh, cumulant to large la, la, larger cumulants. Okay, so that's why uh, the, the 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 entropy of the first cumulant uh, will be decaying just because it flow in the larger cumulants. And for me, there is no reason that for large times or at, or even for a, a, some finite time, you have a kind of uh, blow up where the where you have a, uh, say almost all the entropy in very large cumulants, a kind of very uh, very uh, complex correlations. And another question: uh, what, what happens if you replace uh, hard uh, spheres with? Uh, with some uh, softer potential, the, uh, can one pro do the analysis in a similar way? So as long as the um, say uh, they are a, uh, they have compact uh, range, like so it's, they have a finite range. It's more complicated, but essentially you get the same results. Mm. Uh, now, if you have a, if you have a long range correlation, so any uh, any even a very a very fast decay. Then uh, you end up with a Boltzmann equation with uh, with uh, a cross section which is not integrable, and then it's uh, much much harder. So uh, the only result that I know is uh, the one by Natalie Ayi, where she was able to prove that uh, if you have a double exponential decay of this uh, of this uh, interaction uh, potential, then uh, you can prove that uh, close to equilibrium you have uh, you have convergence to the um, uh, linear Boltzmann. Equation. Oh, the double exponential. I think, yeah, maybe even triple exponential. So it's, 
So, but here I would say that probably it's more like a technical uh, obstruction. Okay, thank you. But for for the, 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 the question about time, I would say that if you are close to equilibrium and you are able to, to measure this uh, proximity to equilibrium by the function like L2 or something like this, then it's okay. You can prove that for, for uh, all times, uh, you have uh, all these results are, are true. Now, if, uh, if you are not close to equilibrium, it's not clear to me that uh, the, the result should be true uh, for, for all the time. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. So would it be possible to, to replace particles by molecules? So, so it, in instead of hard sphere, I mean, of spheres, to have something with a geometric shape? And I wonder whether there would be some effects in the, in the hamilton Jacobi equation. So, um, so th there was a, a work by, um, um, I will, uh, my memory is, um, uh, I will find his name, uh, my Mark Wilkinson on this, this problem. But actually, the problem with the Boltzmann grass scanning is that even though you start from, say, imagine that you start from uh, ellipses instead of uh, uh, spheres, then in the in in this regime, in this Boltzmann grass regime, you don't see any effect of the of the um, of the anisotropy thing. Okay, so it's much more complicated because, of course, if you have uh, ellipses, then uh, you need to uh, take also into account uh, the the angular momentum and so on. So it's really a mess. But in the end. Uh, you end up with the, the same equation, which is not very uh, satisfactory. So if you would like to see a kind of anisotropic effect in the limit, you would need to have a particles which are really like, uh, uh, which, uh, which do not scale uh, the same way in both uh, directions. And this, I don't know how to do, uh, how to do that. So you, you, you should imagine uh, ellip ellipses, but uh, with uh, one axis like, uh, I don't know, square root of epsilon and the other axis like um, uh, epsilon times square root of epsilon or something like this. Else in the limit, you don't see a, a, any difference. So once again, it's much more complicated because, because you have a much more degrees of freedom and it's even very hard to, to prescribe a, a, a good boundary condition for the system. So just the, 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 the problem of writing a good um, a system of equation for ellipses is very, uh, is very complicated because uh, uh, so you have many situations where you cannot avoid, for instance, if you have just two ellipses, uh, so imagine that you have uh, uh, two very uh, elongated ellipses like this, uh, it's not even clear that um, you can prove that uh, there will be only a finite number of uh, recollision between two ellipses. Okay, imagine that you have a very large one like this. And as it uh, will uh, rotate over itself, you can have a lot of uh, recollision just with two uh, objects. So it's really a mess to, to study these kind of problems. But apart from that, uh, in the limit, you don't see any difference. OK, thank you. Other comments? So if you don't forget, I propose to unmute and to upload uh, Laura for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. So thank you again. Laura.